All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, as more people come in, I'll let them into the room. Um, some people do like to sign up so they can get the link after the fact um, of the recording. So I'm sure we'll get plenty of views of this after the fact. Um, there's another one now. And welcome. Uh, so today, uh, today's compelling question is, how do you think like a feminist? Um, and uh, Associate Professor of Philosophy and author Carol Hay is going to uh, address that today. Um, I'd also like to put a special thanks to the Marjorie Scaboria Greenway Fund, or Marjorie Scaboria Fund, uh, which helps fund this program. And Carol, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, Great. Okay, well, um, Danny, thank you for setting this up and I'm grateful to the Chelmsford Library for hosting this event. And um, I'm very much looking forward to talking to folks about this. So my plan is to sort of talk for about 50 minutes and then leave some time for questions, but I can, adjust that depending on how many questions there are and these sorts of things. So if folks have questions, I guess they can put them in the chat. Is that is that how we how you want to do this, um, Danny? Or? That's fine. Uh, they or, can put it into chat or they can unmute and talk. Either way, it doesn't matter. Great. Perfect. Okay. Where it is okay. being recorded. So if you do unmute and talk, you'll be on the recording. Great. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you very much, folks, for coming. I know I was just saying to Danny that these are these are hard times for more Zoom talks. So I'm always grateful when people actually are willing to spend a little bit more time in front of Zoom. Um, for something like this. So thanks folks for being here. Um, I'm here to talk to you about how to think like a feminist. And um, my expertise in this is that I've been trying to do that for a very long time. <laughs> and um, also I actually just wrote a book about it called Think Like a Feminist um, that uh, just came out last September, um, kind of at the height of the pandemic. Um, and um, it's been a really, really interesting process to be able to talk to folks about these sorts of issues. So what I want to do today is sort of talk through um, some stereotypes about what feminism isn't, because I think, I think there are a lot of really commonly held misconceptions about what feminism actually amounts to. Um, so I'll talk about some stereotypes about what feminism isn't, and then I'll give you a definition about what I think feminism is, a nice sort of working definition. Um, and then what I want to do with the rest of the time that we have is to talk through what I think is probably the major um, um, philosophical concept that most uh, feminists um, use to think through a lot of the major issues that, um, that are of interest to feminists, and that is the concept of oppression. So I've got four different metaphors that I find really useful for making sense of understanding oppression as a particular form of harm or injustice. Um, so we'll talk through that, and then we'll go from there. Okay. So I'll just get going. Okay, so I think that um, in my experience, when I say the word feminist, um, it, it's an F word for a lot of people, right? It's, it's a word that has a lot of baggage. Um, sometimes you get people, I like to joke that if I had a dollar um, for every time I heard someone say, I'm not a feminist, but, and then go on to say about a feminist thing, uh, a bunch of feminist things, um, I could probably like close the wage gap single-handedly, right? Um, it's 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 a word with a lot of baggage, and so one of the things I like to do is just sort of you know address that head on, admit that when I say the word feminist, that a lot of people people might have a lot of preconceptions and misconceptions about what that actually means. So um, there are two sort of basic stereotypes that I think um, many people have in mind when they think about feminism. One is what I like to call the angry feminist, right? And so the angry feminist is um, somebody who is um, well, she's mad, right? She's unpleasant. Right, she's um, she's pretty grouchy at the world. She's really pretty unpleasant. She, you know, she gets inexplicably angry at you when you were just trying to hold a door open for her. Right, she can't take a joke. Um, and um, I think it's probably no coincidence that when we think of feminism, a lot of, one thing that, that comes to mind for a lot of people is this really kind of unpleasant idea about um, what feminism amounts to. Um, and that's because I think. You know, when, I, I, you can think of these jokes, right? You can think that, like, you know, feminists, you know, they, you know, they don't wear bras; they burn them, right? And they're very unpleasant, and they're not conventionally feminine, right? They wear, you know, like Birkenstocks, and they. Um, I like to say that feminists, you know, they they just do body hair all wrong, right? So they've got some weird sort of like lesbian haircut, and you know, they have like too much hair on their legs and in their armpits, and not none, not not enough of the right kind of hair on their head, and. Um, right? So it's a, it's a really kind of like unpleasant stereotype that I think pops into a lot of people's heads. And the reason I think that this unpleasant stereotype gets as much traction in our culture at large is because um, if we can write the feminist off as someone who's, who's angry, right? Um, then we don't have to take seriously the question about whether or not she actually has something to be angry about. 
right? And this is something I think that actually is worth taking very seriously, right? But um, but notice, right? So for example, we tend to um, we treat um, women in general. One of the stereotypes we have about women is that they're emotional, right? They're irrational, right? So if we have these sort of like conventional gender types, to be, gender stereotypes. To be clear, I'm not like endorsing these stereotypes. I think I'm just describing what I see them happening out there in the world. One of the stereotypes we have we have of women in general is that women are more emotional and more irrational, you know, kind of crazy, right? Whereas men are sort of rational and level-headed and logical and these sorts of things, right? And so we do that, right? We, we, we characterize women as emotional, right? But what's the one emotion that we don't like it when, when, when that women actually express, right? So women can cry and they can be, they can be over the top in all these sort of emotional ways. But if a woman expresses anger, the mere expression of that anger is all we really need to write her off as not worth, worth, worth taking seriously. And this is actually doubly so if she's a woman of color, right? So, um, and so there's a, there's a great feminist named, um, named Bell Hooks who points out that um, for all of, you know, for all of the, the quickness we have to characterize women as rational and also people of uh, color as irrational and, and emotional, the one emotion we don't let them have is anger. And anger is the one emotion that might actually get things done, right? That might actually change the world, right? Because anger can be a really powerful emotion um, for social change, right? And so it's probably no coincidence that we have this way of sort of thinking about anger in these oppressed groups as um, a way of um, just writing them off, right? Exactly, I would think of women as, as, as hysterical, right? So I think that sort of feeds into this way of undermining feminism because we can sort of write feminists off as crazy and so we don't have to listen to them, we don't have to take them seriously, we don't have to ask, hey, maybe, maybe they actually have something you know, worth being angry about. So, um, so it's true, I think, that, it, that, that many feminists are angry, right, you know, because they have eyes and they have ears and they have a mind and they can look at the world and they see the injustice in the world and they understand that this is something that's not fair and that it's something worth get, get, getting mad about, right? But then we find um, feminists in this sort of catch-22 where um, merely expressing that anger is all we need to sort of write them off and not take them seriously, right? So one of the things I like to do is just really just sort of remind us that it's okay to be angry, right? It's okay, okay to be angry in the face of injustice, right? That anger in the face of injustice is actually a really appropriate reaction, right? Um, there's a great new book uh, that just came out by a feminist philosopher named Maisha Cherry. She's a, 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 a woman of color. And the book is called The Case for Rage. And so she's actually given, giving us this, this, just this, this feminist defense of anger, right? And why anger is a really appropriate emotion in the face of injustice. So I highly recommend that. I'll put that in the chat if folks wanna see it. It's called The Case for Rage um, by Maisha Cherry. Sorry, um, Maisha Cherry. I really recommend that if you're looking for more book recommendations. And th this book just came out a couple of weeks ago. It's with Brent, Brent Sank in it. Okay, so um, that's the one stereotype of feminism is it is when feminists are just angry, right? Um, and again, it, it, in the face of that, I like to remind people that, oh, you know, maybe we need to sort of like uh, recognize that when a woman expresses anger, we have this tendency to not take her seriously just because she's expressing that anger. And we have to be careful and guard against that. And instead we should ask, okay, but is, does she have something to be angry about? Is this anger justified? And very often it is in these cases. Right? Mm -hmm. so that's the first stereotype of feminism, the angry feminist. And I want to defend the angry feminist and say, yeah, we're mad and we're mad for good reason. Right? Um, the, uh, the second stereotype of feminism is a little more interesting because this stereotype is actually often a, um, in the head of people who themselves might actually identify as feminists. Right? So angry feminism is usually used as a, as a way to not take feminists seriously, right? But there's a different un, a misunderstanding of feminism that I think uh, gets a different kind of traction is another way of sort of under, undercutting the, so the, the radical potential of feminism, but it's in some ways a little more insidious because it tends to actually be held by at least some people who themselves consider themselves to be feminist. And that, all right, so I'll write this down in the chat for you. There's the angry feminist, there's the stereotypes, there's the angry feminist, And the second stereotype is what I call the girl power feminist, right? It's the girl power feminist, right? You know, she's feisty. She's, um, you know, she's, 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 she's it's kind of, you know, you go girl attitude, right? She's, um, but she's not off-putting, right? She's pleasant, right? She's this sort of like kinder, gentler feminist, right? So, you know, you get the kind of like, you know, sometimes you'll say, you'll hear people saying, oh, I, I'm a feminist, but don't worry, I still like men. Like, don't worry, I'm not a threatening feminist. I'm a nice, I'm a happy feminist, right? I'm a, I'm a sex positive feminist, right? I'm a feminist that, um, right, that isn't necessarily gonna upset people's understandings of uh, the way the world is in, in, in any real way. Um, 
And the girl power feminist is, I mean, it's like back in the day, the Spice Girls kind of, I think, invented the genre of the idea of girl power. Right? Um, a really nice, contem or a relatively contemporary example of the girl power feminist is um, a statue that, that was put up on Wall Street um, right around the beginning of the Me Too movement. And the statue is called um, uh, the, the Fearless Girl. Right? And I, I recommend you can do a quick Google search and find the fearless girl. And the fearless girl is a really nice example of girl power feminism, right? Because what is she? She's this, well, she's, so she's a white girl and she's this gorgeous statue of this, of this really kind of like angry white girl with these really cute pigtails. And she's facing down the bull on Wall Street, right? And people loved the fearless girl, right? Because she's, you know, she's like, like she, look at this, Liam, like this, this, this feisty little girl who's staring down, you know, the bull on Wall Street, right? And girls can do anything, right? We live, in, we live in a society that loves to tell little girls that they can do anything, right? They can, be, they can be the president, they can be an astronaut, they can be a firefighter, they can do whatever they want, right? We love that, right? Um, what we don't live in is a world where we're actually willing to um, let the women that those fearless girls are going to turn into um, take the power. Right, so it's no coincidence that it wasn't an angry woman facing down the bull on Wall Street. Like we, we don't find an angry woman facing down um, a, 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 the bull on Wall Street to be to be you know, cute or enticing. We, we would find that off-putting and weird, right? But a fearless girl, that's fine, right? Because what? Because I mean, little girls are great, but at the end of the day, little girls actually can't face down bulls or anything else. They're still just kids, right? Um, so, but girl power feminists lets us feel good about ourselves, right? It lets us think that, oh, no, we, we, we want to sort of empower you know, the children. We want to sort of, you know, like, we want to feel like you know, we're, we're doing the right sort of thing, but we don't have to sort of face these, these, these uncomfortable questions that um, uh, a, 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 a more radical version of feminism is going gonna, is gonna to make us deal with, right? So um, corporate types have been very good at using the girl power feminists to just sell stuff in general, right? So you can think of like body wash or these sorts of things, or there are a lot of advertising campaigns that really like to sort of like, celebrate girl power. Um, but the girl power is just, you know, to get us to buy more stuff, right? So it it's turns into sort of like feminism as like lifestyle choice, right? And again, this um, this version of feminism isn't really going to ups, 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 ups the status quo in any way, right? It's going to just make us, you know, buy more body wash or whatever it is. Again, not really a, a, a threat in any real way. Um, this stereotype is, is also often racialized, right? So sometimes when I'm talking to my students of color, right, they'll say, I'm not a feminist because feminism is for white women. And I'm not like, and that like feminism doesn't speak to me because feminism is, is a white lady thing, right? And I think that's in part because what they have in mind is a kind of girl power feminism, right? Where we have like, you know, corporate women's leadership events. And right, the, like the point of feminism is to get a few more women into like the upper, upper, upper echelons of power. And that's all we really, really need to, um, to, to, to sort of you know, solve these problems is you know, if, we, if we can get a, a female president or more female CEOs or these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And again, by themselves, th th those may be good things, but are they, um, if, if the, the thought here is that justice doesn't trickle down, right? Just like trickle down, trickle, down, trickle down economics doesn't work, justice also doesn't trickle down, right? So the point of feminism can't just be to focus on these women in our culture who already have a relative, relative amount, um, amount of privilege. Right, women who are, you know, have, have, the, have the kinds of jobs where they could maybe, um, oh good, I see Fearless Girl in the, in the chat, thanks for that. Um, right, so um, the, the point of feminism isn't just to help those women who um, are already doing pretty well, right? The, the point of feminism is supposed to be to help everyone, right? Now, I do think that historically the feminist movement has not been great at recognizing this. We can actually sort of, um, if, you, if, you, if you read the book or if you uh, spend a little bit more time studying the history of feminism, one of the things you see is that the history of feminism is also a history of racism and a history of classism and a history of relatively so, uh, socially privileged women using the feminist movement um, for their, for their goals, often at the expense of women who are much less well off, right? So if all feminism cares about is getting more female CEOs, then what those women who wanna be these CEOs are gonna do is you know, hi, like hire a poor woman of color and underpay her to take care of all of the domestic work and the childcare and stuff like that, that she no longer has time to because she's off being a businesswoman. Right. So again, so this can't be the goal of feminism to just focus on relatively privileged women. And unfortunately, this has been a tendency that we've seen a lot in the feminist movement. Um, so again, so that's something that, that, that I think it's if, if we want to sort of think like a feminist, we really sort of have to recognize the historical mistakes, the ways that um, feminists have failed to do that. And we'll talk about that a little, uh, a little bit later on in the talk today as well. So that's what feminism isn't. Feminism isn't just a bunch of irrationally angry women, right? Or irrationally angry people, right? When feminists are angry, they're angry because they have a good reason to be angry, right? And feminism isn't just this kind of like watered down, denuded, defanged girl power um, 
thing that celebrates women and celebrates women's choices just because it's a woman choosing it, right? Feminism makes us ask hard questions like, are women themselves actually choosing things that make things worse for other women? Because if they are, then that's not a feminist choice, you might think, right? So that's what feminism isn't. Um, and again, I talk a lot more about this in the book. I have a whole chapter on, on the girl power feminist and the angry feminist. What feminism is, is a little harder to define, unfortunately. Um, and in part, I think that makes sense, right? Because if we're talking about a social movement that claims to have the interests of like half of the people on the planet at its, at, at its center, um, it's gonna have to be really, really diverse and really diffuse, right? We're talking like, like women don't have a lot in common with other women many times, right? So I mean, what do I, you know, a cis white woman in North America have in common with um, a poor brown woman in India. Maybe not very much, like my life is probably really pretty different, right? So if feminism is gonna make sense of both of our experiences and if feminism is gonna be able to advocate for both of us, it's gonna have to be this really sort of big tent movement, right? So the definition of feminism that I, um, that I prefer is one that is sort of intentionally very sort of broad, right? Because it needs to sort of accommodate all of these different life experiences. And so the way I like to put it is this, I like to say that you count as a feminist if, first of all, you agree with the social scientists and the historians, right? Not the philosophers, right? I mean, obviously you should agree with us philosophers, but <laughs> no. Um, so you're a feminist if you agree with the people whose job it is to, among other things, figure out what makes a human life go well, figure out if a human life is going well, right? So all of these measures of quality of life. It turns out there, there isn't one right way to, like, what, or only one way to measure whether a human life is going well, right? Because we're really pretty complex creatures, right? So, um, uh, so, so sometimes, sometimes when, we're, when we're measuring quality of life, we look at things like life expectancy or health or how much money you have or how much control or autonomy you have over your day-to-day -day life, right? How likely you are to see people like you represented in positions of social prestige or power, right? How much power you actually have over your life, right? How happy you are, right? All of these things, right? There are lots of different ways to measure how well someone's life is going, okay? There isn't just one. Um, but it turns out that basically by every single metric we have to measure quality of life, women don't do as well as men. Historically and today, across cultures, women do not do as well as men. Their lives don't go as well as men's, as men's do. But again, this is not to say that all men's lives are amazing, right? Of course not. Obviously everyone faces um, you know, troubles and again, we'll talk about that in a minute, but in general, no, no matter how you measure quality of life, um, women's is not as high as men's, both today and historically. Right? Um, and so you're a feminist if you agree with that, right? Again, that's the, those are just the, the, the facts that the social scientists, right? The economists, the sociologists, all of those folks, that's what they report. So you're a feminist if you just agree with the scientists, you agree with the empirical facts, right? So there's a single fact, right? Women don't do as well as men. Um, so, right, this, so there's um, this the notes for you. There's definition of feminism. Um, there is the, well, number one, there's the empirical fact that women's quality of life is worse than men's. The second thing, you're a feminist if you, again, you agree with that, that empirical fact. And then second of all, if you think that um, this is a bad thing, right? That it's not a good thing, right? that it's not inevitable, right? That women aren't these sort of inherently inferior creatures, which so obviously they're not gonna flourish in the way that men, men are. I mean, to be clear, people did used to think, I think that, right? So like, if you look at like Aristotle, the, you know, the, the ancient Greek, if you looked at his, his, his conception of biology, he really did think that women were just these sort of like malformed men. Right, that they, they were just like the, the real human being was a, was a male and women were just men who hadn't properly formed right and so he so he had this weird view where like women's ovaries were actually the testes that just hadn't descended right and he also thought we had fewer teeth for some reason that one's weird i don't know if you could just count them i guess but yeah so he thought women had fewer teeth but he thought women had less of this sort of vital energy that's this sort of life force um they had less vital heat and that sort of caused their bodies to be malformed in these ways and it also meant that um his understanding of reproduction was, was really weird too. He thought that um, when um, that men provided the um, the um, the form of the human being, right? So, so when we make new new human beings, really, it's men who are giving us the you know the the, the new human being. Women are just pro just providing the matter, right? Because they, because they don't have enough of this vital heat to be able to provide the form themselves, right? So like now we know the obviously in biology has changed. <laughs> Our understanding of biology has you know, advanced quite a bit. We know that that's not true, right? Well, but we, well, we still do get this sort of holdover in some way, in, in some circles where, pe where people really do think that women are just inferior to men. They're just like, you know, something with their hormones makes them inferior, right? But that's actually a pretty fringe view at this point. Most, most people don't think that there is any sort of like 
biological explanation for why women wouldn't flourish as well as men do. So if you're a, fe so you're a feminist, if you think that this, um, this inequality isn't inevitable, and it's not a good thing, right? You don't think that women deserve this, right? Um, so that's the second thing. There is a normative or a moral belief, moral belief that this inequality is neither inevitable nor right. So it's something that we can and should change, right? Because again, so you might think it's a bad thing, but there's nothing we can do about it, right? So again. That would, that, that would be the reason to throw your hands up. But you're a feminist again. So if you think there's this inequality, and if you think that we're not stuck with it, right? We can change it, we can, we can make it better, right? Then I think you're a feminist, basically, right? I'd like to add one, in, in one further plank to this definition. Um, and that is that I think that feminists um, understand that these problems of inequality aren't gonna be problems that we can solve sort of piecemeal. Right, so th this is to go back to the, the, this recognition of the historical failings of the feminist movement to recognize that women across race, across class, um, these, are, uh, these sorts of things don't all have the same experiences and that some women really do have a lot more privilege than others. Right? And again, there was this historical failure among feminists to really sort of attend, attend to that privilege properly. Right? And the thought is that if you don't attend to it, then what you're gonna end up doing is entrenching um, the injustice somewhere, some, in some other place. It's almost like whack-a-mole, you know, that, 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 that carnival game, you know, where you pop it down here and it pops up somewhere else, right? That's what it looks like, right? So if you're a feminist who think that all feminists have to do is um, help uh, middle-class and rich white women, you know, achieve the social status of middle-class and rich white men, then you might actually make some progress in making the world better for those relatively privileged uh, rich white women, but you're actually gonna make things, end up making things worse for other women, right? You know, the nannies and the, and the, and the, and the domestic help that, that you end up sort of then exploiting in this other sort of project, right? And again, if you look at the history of the feminist movement, we, we, we see this happening time and time again, right? So, this, so I like to call this a sort of interpretive lens, right? Interpretive lens that recognizes that sexism is related to racism classism, homophobia, that's it. Those, those, those three things. If you can like smile and nod or like check each of those um, bullet points off, then yep, I think you count as a feminist, right? You don't have to agree with, with other feminists on exactly what the problems are. You certainly don't have to agree with other feminists on exactly what the solutions are gonna be. But um, if you can sort of nod to these three things, then I think that, yeah, you're, you're already thinking like a feminist. Okay, that's it in a nutshell. Any quick questions before I move, we move on to a little more of the, the, the philosophical nuts and bolts here? Any thoughts on this? Okay, well, then I will keep going. Okay, so, so there is one concept um, that I wanna spend the rest of the time talking about, and that is the concept of oppression, okay? Oppression is a particular kind of harm or injustice, right? So um, it's again, it's a word with a lot of different meanings. We use it to mean a lot of things. Sometimes, you know, we call you know the heat in the summer. We say, oh, heat is oppressive, right? You know, there's that great old Monty Python sketch, sketch in the life of Brian, right, where they're saying, "Don't you oppress me?" And like, that's not really what feminists mean um, when we're talking about oppression, right? So oppression isn't just a, you know, it, it isn't just some random harm or injustice, and it's not necessarily even. Um, to call something oppressive isn't necessarily to say that it's the worst kind of harm or injustice, right? It's to say that it's a particular kind of harm or, harm or injustice. It's a harm or injustice that is systematically connected up to other harms or, or injustices, okay? But the, it can be kind of hard to wrap your head around on exactly what this means, right? The idea that, 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 that oppression is, this, is, is, a, is a set of harm or injustice that is systematically interrelated to other harms or injustices. We need, we need to get a lot more concrete. And so there's a, here's a metaphor. Um, I'm going to give you four metaphors. The first metaphor, the first metaphor is that of a, um, a bird cage. And it goes like this. Okay, say that you are looking at a bird. Okay, and this bird is just like failing to thrive. Right, its feathers are all dirty and kind of falling out. It's like starving. It's kind of sickly. This bird is just really, really not doing well in its bird life. Right, and you're trying to figure out what the heck is wrong with this bird. Right, and you're you got your face right up in the bird's face. You're like, bird, what is wrong with you? Why are you starving? Why aren't you taking care of yourself? Like, 
like there's a pile of bird seed like right in front of you and you can't even be bothered to like go and eat it like what's wrong with you bird right you can't for the life of you figure out why this bird is not flourishing because you're right up there looking at the bird but then you step back just a step and you realize oh oh there's a wire there's a wire in between the bird and the bird seed and it's like it's not electric wire it's not razor wire but it's a wire right and that single wire explains why the bird isn't hopping straight forward to get the bird seed because there's a wire in its way. Okay, but then, oh, but then you think, okay, but seriously bird, you're gonna let one wire, like one single setback and get you, get in between you and what you need to flourish and thrive. Like, come on bird, ever hear of a little thing called grit? Like, come on, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, walk around the wire or fly around the wire, you're a bird, right? And go and get the bird seed, right? And then you step back, just another step. And you realize, oh wait, no, there's actually not one wire, there's two wires and they're attached. Right? And you realize, oh, okay, so by like the two wires, because they're connected, actually collectively block off a much bigger swath of the bird's path than um, any single wire would be able to do. Okay, but again, two wires, but two setbacks, really bird, come on. Two setbacks is, 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 is gonna explain wh why, why your life is so awful? Eh, probably not. You stay back a little bit more and you realize that it's not two wires, it's three wires, it's four wires, it's hundreds of wires, a bird is in a bird cage, okay? And again, a birdcage is just a bunch of wires which by themselves would really be at most sort of minor inconveniences, like small setbacks, something that really, you know, like it, 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 anyone can have a bad day, anyone can have bad luck, everyone can have a, a flat tire, whatever it is, right? Um, by themselves, if you're only ever looking at these harms or injustice, injustices by themselves, you're never really gonna understand how they collectively keep the bird in the birdcage. Right? So this metaphor is a really, really useful way for way of understanding what feminists mean when they talk about the systematic um, and structural nature of oppressive harms and injustices, right? That these are the kinds of harms or injustices that you, you're only really ever gonna understand how they work when you understand how they're connected up to other harms and injustices. They don't happen in a vacuum. They're not just a one-off, okay? Right, and so this explains why feminists, you know, feminists will like, sometimes you, you, you hear feminists talking about things that just really seem like that not, not, not that big a deal. Like, oh, okay, sorry. Like you told an off-color joke, who cares, right? And it's true, like if the only thing a woman ever had to experience in her life that was annoying was a few off-color jokes, like they'd be fine, right? But the whole point is that no, those off-color jokes are connected up to a lot of other things, right? They're connected up to the fact that, um, you know, we live in a world that has a very particular understanding of what, what men and women are supposed to be like, right? And women experience like all of these different sorts of har harms or injustices that are connected up, right? And so again, this also explains why feminists say that men can't be oppressed. Right? Sometimes uh, men's rights activists hear this and they think, oh my God, those feminists are crazy. Right? They think that, 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 that men can't be harmed. That's absurd. Obviously men can be harmed. Of course men can be harmed, right? But the thought here is that like, um, if I'm going around and if, if, if I'm a feminist who has a penchant for like kicking men in the knees, because I don't like men, because I'm an angry feminist, even though we know that that's not true, right? Um, but even if that were true, right? It's not as if men live in a world in general where this is the kind of harm or injustice that they're likely to experience. Right? Whereas that's not the case for women, right? Women experience cat calls, women experience sexual harassment, women experience sexual violence and rape, right? Women experience the wage gap, right? Women make, a, even now, about 80 cents for every dollar that a man makes, right? Women experience uh, social norms that expect them to sacrifice their interests for the sake of their families, especially their children, right? Um, women experience a world where um, they're told from the beginning that um, what they look like is more important than how they feel. Right, these sorts of things that, 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 that their primary purpose is existing for, you know, to, to serve men. Right, all of these things are connected up, and I could go on. I could spend the rest of the uh, the rest of this hour just listing off all of the different harms or injustices that feminists have pointed out. Right, but we don't have we don't we don't have time for that. Right, so what I want us to really kind of pay attention to now is that when feminists say that oppression is this kind of systematic and structural harm, what they're saying is that we need to understand how all of these harms are connected up. And um, we're never really going to understand why they're so harmful unless we're unless we're able to do that. Okay. So that's the oppression, or the, that, that that's the birdcage metaphor for oppression. Again, um, so again, so so um, when a feminist say that a man can't be oppressed, she's not saying that a man can't be can be harmed. And when a feminist saying is saying, saying that, that a woman is oppressed, um, she's not necessarily saying that the harm or injustice that she's experience, experiencing is worse than a harm or injustice that a man might be, be experiencing. She's just saying that, listen, there's a feature of this harm or injustice that's unique, right? That's connected up in, the, in, in, in these various ways. And we have these theories to explain how all of these things are connected, okay? All right, that's the first metaphor. Metaphor number two, invisible mask. 
The Invisible Not Sack um, comes to us from um, a feminist anti-racist scholar named Peggy McIntosh. And so she actually came up with this in the context of discussing how racism works, but it works also for, uh, for, for sexism. So we'll, we'll talk about it here. Okay, so um, think about the, uh, 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 the, uh, the invisible knapsack like this. I am a white lady, right? The world is easier for me because I'm a white person than it would be if I were a person of color, right? Um, and this looks like a lot of different things, right? This looks like I can, you know, I can get behind the wheel of my car and speed a little bit, and I don't have to worry about being pulled over for driving while black, right? Whereas, you know, like my, um, I, I had a student uh, last week in class, um, this uh, the student of color, tell me that he was, um, he was a meter reader in his, like his, his, his part-time job while he's going to college. He, he, he reads meters for the gas company, right? Um, and he says that he regularly is able to read fewer meters on his shift than his white colleagues, because at least once a week, someone calls the cops on him because, you know, he's a scary looking black man. Because we, as a, yeah, like, what you, what's, what's your job as a meter reader? Your job is to go onto someone's property uninvited and look at their house, right? It looks shady, right? Because he's a person of color, right? Um, so he says he's, he, he's lucky his boss understands this and his boss doesn't mind that he has to, you know, spend some, part of his shift at least once a week explaining it to the cops. No, I'm the meter reader. Yes, here's my ID. Yes, I'm allowed to be here, right? Um, but it's something that I, as a white person, don't have to deal with, right? I don't have to like build in extra time in my travel schedule to like assume that I'm gonna get pulled over for a random search at the airport, right? Um, I like to joke that um, maybe I should like think about like bolstering my, my professor salary with like a side gig as a drug mule. Cause like nobody's going in, is gonna go in a nice white lady's purse, right? Like you know, these privileges, there's these perks I get for being a white person, right? I can like, I can buy band-aids and they match my skin tone. And I can buy dolls or books for my nine-year-old daughter, and they—it's—it's it's just it's really easy to find um, representations of kids who look like her, right? All of these things just sort of like um, Macintosh says we should think of them as sort of like all of these tools, all of these um, privileges that we have. In an, it's, it's like white people walk around the world with an invisible knapsack, right? We walk around the world that's made by and for people like us, and it just makes it easier to get through the day. Um, again, does it mean that I'm not that, that I'm not going to face um, like setbacks or harms? Of course not, right? But it does mean that in general, it's just easier for me to exist in the world because I'm a white person, right? And this is uh, these are all the privileges in my invisible knapsack, right? Um, so we can just sort of think about you know like the world's being sort of like set up to make it easier if you're a certain kind of person. So I have these privileges because I'm a white person, um, but there are certain privileges I don't have because I'm a woman, right? So you can sort of think about you know, like like different people depending on their social position, right? Whether they're male, whether they're rich, whether they're um, whether they're heterosexual, these sorts of things, they, 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 they can either give you more stuff in your invisible knapsack or they can take stuff away from your invisible knapsack sack of privilege, right? So this, this, this gives us a way to sort of think about um, how privilege works. A nice example, I think of this, that, I, um, uh, that, my, that my students have been wanting to talk about this uh, lately, so it's, it's fresh on my mind, so I'll give it to you as well. Maybe you'll find it interesting. Um, so, um, Folks, I, I assume we've heard of uh, the phenomena of man spreading. Yeah, have we heard of man spreading? Yeah, I hope. So, man spreading is this phenomena of where um, men on public transit take up too much room, right? They sit there with their knees wide open and they take up at least two seats when they could just be sitting and taking up one, right? My students complain about this. There's a shuttle that goes back and forth um, to, to different parts of my campus. My students tell me about like, the man spreading is just rampant on, on the campus shuttles, right? The guys just sit and they just take up the whole seat and the women either have to kind of make themselves small to take up not as much uh, as, as space um, or they have to sort of like fight for space in a way that like in, ends up you know, leading to all sorts of uncomfortable situations. Right? Um, I talk about the, stra uh, the, 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 the strategy for, um, for dealing with a man spreader in the book. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that hanging. If you want, we can talk about it later in the question period as well. But I, but I do think that I've actually stumbled upon a solution to man spreading that, um, that women can use when, when, when they encounter men who are doing this. Um, I also think it's interesting that I think I've stumbled upon a new version of the kind of like entitlement to public space that, that is the, probably the best way to understand what man spreading is. Um, I think there's a new version of man spreading that, that we're seeing um, a, 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 in the sort of post pandemic world. And that is the phenomenon of people refusing to wear a mask in public space, right? So in Massachusetts, right, we have mask mandates anywhere, anytime you're in public, anytime you're in a store, anytime you're on a bus, anytime you're on a train, anytime you're in an airport, you are supposed to be wearing a mask, right? Um, but lots of people don't, right? But it's actually not true. So I like, so this is a challenge I like to give folks. I think it would be cool if you all went out into the world and just did a mental tally of every time you saw someone not wearing a mask properly, right? And we'll know that look, what that looks like, right? The mask goes under the nose, right? Right. 
Every time you saw someone not wearing a mask pro pro properly, ask yourself, is that person not a white man? Because I think you'll be, you'll be surprised, right? Again, so I, we're, we're seeing this sort of like new way of expressing, ah, you know, my discomfort is more, it, 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 me dealing with my discomfort is more important than, you know, keeping us all safe, right? Which is what the mask mandates are supposed to do, right? It's the kind of thing that you're allowed to get away with if, if you have an invisible ma uh, knapsack of stuff made for people like you, right? You don't have to keep your mask up, right? Um, I noticed this, this even in my teaching, right? So at, at UMass, we have um, the mask mandate in the classroom, right? We're all supposed to be wearing a mask. I'm teaching, I'm lecturing through a mask. It's not fun, believe me, you get lightheaded, right? But you do it, you, you do it to keep everyone safe, right? Um, and I have to go into like full mom mode so many times, right? Because I have to like continually, and it's always the white guys. It's always the white or the white men, the young white men who for some reason, oh, that mask just slips down. And I'm like, have to stop lecture to say, put your mask up, right? Um, and again, and, and um, I don't think it's because, you know, these white men are horrible people, but I think it's because these white men have, you know, reached all of the 18 or 20 years of age that, that, that they have in a world that is saturated with the message that they matter and that they, that their discomfort matters and that that matters more than other things. And I think that other, uh, other you know, that, that women, I think people of color don't grow up in a world saturated with those messages. And, and, I, think, and I think it shows up even in weird things like, you know, refusal, refusal to, bother, to bother wearing a mask properly, right? Okay, so that's the invisible knapsack. Any questions on that? I promise I will come back and give you the, um, the solution to men spreading on public transit. Uh, if, if you come up with a solution to um, the mask drop, please let me know. Cause all I do, I, I either end up sort of like, you know, politely and slightly like kind of passive aggressively asking people to put their masks on or, you know, just seizing in rage, you know? But yeah, here we go. But I think it, it is, I think important for us to sort of, as we're out in the world, think about these things and think about how privilege manifest itself in ways that are sometimes really subtle, but then once you see it, you can't unsee it. Okay, um, the third metaphor that I want to, just to discuss, this is what's known as, this is a weird word, but I'll unpack it for you. It's called the panopticon. Panopticon is a, um, it is, it's actually a model prison. It's like a design for a model prison invented by Jeremy Bentham, who is um, the father of utilitarianism, which is a school of um, moral philosophy. But Bentham was also just sort of a, a social critic in general. And um, he came up with an idea for a new kind of penitentiary. And this is right, again, this is right around the time that um, you know, a couple hundred years ago, there, it, it used to be the case that prisons actually weren't seen as punishment or even as necessarily like, it, it was, was, certainly they weren't about rehabilitation, right? Prisons were just a way to sort of like keep people like, off the streets until you figured out how you were going to punish them, right? So they were in prison for not very long, and then you would figure out, oh, you have to send them off to debt, you know, to, to the debt collectors, or you have to put them in stocks, or you have to like publicly flog them, or like whatever sort of barbaric practices they had for punishment back then, right? Um, and then there was this shift right around this time that, that Bentham's writing, where he realized, where he and others like them realized that no, no, we actually like, we, like, we have to sort of think that maybe people can do better, that we could, people can like be rehabilitated, and, if, and so the, for, for the first time, prisons came to be seen as um, as an opportunity for, for rehabilitation and not merely even just punishment, right? So this is actually where we get the word penitentiary from, right? Penitentiary comes from the word penitent, right? Basically prisons, penitentiaries are designed to be like a kind of timeout for grownups, right? Where you sit in the corner and think about what you've done, right? And so the model for penitentiaries really was like you, 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 you put people in a room with a Bible and let them think about what they've done. And they will by themselves come to realize that they did this thing that was bad and they won't do it anymore, right? That was the model for penitentiaries. That was the inspiration behind what ended up, you know, I mean, we all know what prisons have turned into now. It's a huge nightmare, right? But a couple hundred years ago, prisons actually um, were seen as this kind of humane alternative to just punishing people for the sake of punishing them, right? Instead, of the, the, the thought really was that we were supposed to, prisons were meant to rehabilitate people, okay? All right, so then with that background, with, with that backdrop, um, Bentham came up with this new idea for a different kind of prison. So it's like an archeological, or no, no, no. so it's, it's, a, it's like an architectural plan for a new kind of prison. And it works like this. Okay, so basically you have, um, you have a, um, a single guard tower, right, right in the middle. And then around this guard tower, um, I think folks to hear me, okay. Um, so around this guard tower, we have a ring of cells. Okay? And every single cell one lives in, okay? 
And um, so you see how this works, right? You've got a single guard tower and you've got a lot of different cells and their cells open out into the central courtyard, okay? Um, you can have like many, many floors of cells and still just one guard tower. And so this is in one single guard can actually guard like hundreds, maybe even thousands of prisoners all at once. Because think about it, what is it like? What is your life going to be if you're sitting in, if you're living in a panopticon, right? What's it going to be like? You are, um, you know, you're alone. You're sitting there by yourself, you know, thinking about what you've done, right? And you know that you're being watched, but you don't really know that you're being watched. You know that, there, that there's a chance that you're being watched, right? Because again, like seriously, I mean, like you you could play the odds, right? You, like you could think, okay, if there's one guard in there and there's like hundreds of hundreds of, of other prisoners that the guard is also kind of keeping an eye on. Maybe the guard's not like the chances of the guard looking at me at any like a particular moment are actually pretty low. So maybe I could get away with it, right? Maybe I could get get away with doing something I know I'm not supposed to do, and maybe the guard won't catch me. Right? So in in the Panopticon, you also have right li living life under surveillance, right? So you 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 also have um, th this practice where if the guard catches you doing something bad, the punishment is really really swift and really public. So everyone else has to see you being punished for stepping out of line. And Bentham thought that um, this is all you need to really sort of like get people to just sort of realize, like just like really internalize the, the idea that um, that they might be that, 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 that they might be watched. Okay. okay, so then after Bentham, we get a um, a new um, a philosopher named Michel Foucault, who's a French um, philosopher from, from like he was writing in like the 1970s and the 80s, so like flash forward to like 150 years or so. Um, Foucault realizes, hey, Bentham's panopticon is actually a really, really powerful metaphor for understanding what it's like to live in modern society in general, living life under surveillance, as Laura says, right? Um, because if you are, um, if, <laughs> if you're just sort of assuming that you're being watched at all times, you're going to behave yourself, right? And as we're sort of realizing that, that, that Foucault realized this in the 1970s, right? Before we have, you know, like, cameras on every street corner and we have like, you know, um, you know, like GPS technology and like everything else is like guaranteed the death of privacy. But like Foucault saw this coming, right? Because Foucault said that like even in the 1970s and 80s, right? We live in a society where people internalize the norms of what's expected of, of them, right? They learn to act as if they're being watched and then they sort of guard their own behavior, right? So the name of Foucault's book was Discipline and Punish. And Foucault says that living in modern society, basically what we've learned how to do is discipline and punish ourselves, right? And this is how we understand social order, right? You don't need, you know, like a soldier on every, on, with a machine gun on every, on every corner to keep people in line because people have internalized the idea that, that themselves, that they have to keep themselves in line, okay? Um, and so what happens is that feminists then have come along and taken Foucault's uh, metaphor, an uh, uh, understanding of Bentham's prison, and said and and talked about all of the very all, all of the all of the gender specific ways that um, that women in particular are expected to discipline and punish themselves, right? So um, this is where you this is this is one way to sort of understand a lot of the feminist criticisms that are out there of um, the, uh, female beauty standards, right? And the idea that women are objectified and treated treated as if they're just merely sex objects. Right, the thought is that women actually internalize this, right? They, they internalize these norms, right? Like no one forced me to put makeup on for y'all this morning. I just did it, right? I, was, like, I wasn't, you know, like at gunpoint being forced to put makeup on, but I did, right? Because I've internalized these norms that this is what I'm supposed to look like, right? And this is what women do, right? We, um, we, we, we internalize these, these gender norms, these gender roles. Right. Um, and, and, and it's, it's it, once you start, start to realize that this is how sexist oppression sort of perpetuates itself, right? It's not as if, you know, sexism is just a matter of like men intentionally trying to keep women down. No, no, no. Right. Women participate in this stuff willingly a lot of the time. Right. And that's something that I talk about a lot about in the book is, the, is all of the ways that it actually makes sense for women to go along with a lot of these um, sexist norms and uh, social roles standards, um, even though at the end of the day, it makes things worse for them and for all other women as well. Right? So yeah, so the so the panopticon is a, is, a, is a useful way for sort of understanding um, how a lot of this stuff gets internalized. And um, one very quick takeaway that I that I, I like to leave folks with, like things that they can that they can go and do differently, like really really like actionable things. Here's an actionable thing you can do to make make things make, make things better, right? So feminists point out that we live in a world that tells women that the most important thing about them is what they look like, right? Um, Whereas 
you know, what, what, the most important thing about what, what a man does is like, you know, well, what he does with his life, what he wants to do, his hopes and dreams, his goals, his ability to go out in the world and do things, right? But for women, that's less important than, than you know, just being seen as, as to, to, to be conventionally attractive. Right? Um, and this training starts really early. Right? So I want, I want you to ask yourself, and I want you to be honest with yourself. What is the first thing that you do when you are making small talk with a little girl for the first time? I bet, I'm willing to bet that the first thing you do when you see a little girl and you're, and you're trying to be nice to her, you're just meeting her for the first time, you say something like, you're so pretty. I love your dress. Oh, do you like princesses? Yeah, I know princesses are wonderful. You, you are such a beautiful princess yourself, right? That's the kind of thing we say to little girls and they beam, right? They're like, they're so happy, right? Because they're smart. They figured out that this is something that's really important for them is that they be, that is that they're seen as pretty and you just gave them a little cookie you just told them yep you're pretty right good excellent they love it right even but notice what you're doing you are obviously not intentionally but you are giving them the message that this is the most important thing about you not whether you're happy not whether you're funny or smart or interesting or have cool things to say the most important thing is that you are a pretty pretty princess right we do it without even meaning to right um what's the first thing you do when you when you when you meet a little boy for the first time do you talk about? Do you talk to him about how, how handsome he is? Do you talk to him about how how, how, how how pretty his clothes are? No, you're like, hey, bud, you got a dino on your shirt. Do you like dinosaurs? Yeah, dinosaurs are awesome, right? You talk to him about the world. You talk to him about his his, his place in the world, like things he can do with the world, right? You are giving him the message that yes, the world is your oyster. Go out and explore, have fun, right? Um, so your homework is to stop doing this. It's gonna feel weird, weird at first, but your homework is to when you're talking to a little girl. Talk to her about literally anything except what she looks like. Just don't bring it up. It's not relevant. Why is it relevant? Right? Talk to her about what books she likes to read. Talk to her about what iPad games she likes to play. Talk to her about anything except what she looks like. And if you're talking to a little boy, tell him he's looking really handsome today. Right? Flip the switch. Flip the narrative. Right? No, people are going to look at you funny, but it's worth it. <laughs> Right. Because again, I think that, the, that even these small, again, like, is this going to be the one thing that like, you know, destroys the patriarchy? No. Right. But this is a wire in a birdcage. Right. And if we all just start attacking these, these little wires, you know, we can make some progress. Okay. Um, I want to give us one last metaphor to, um, to discuss. And that is the metaphor of the trap. Okay. Right. This metaphor comes to us from a feminist named Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and she's a feminist legal scholar, a woman of color. And um, she is trying to describe the experience of being oppressed on what oppression theorists call multiple axes, right? And, and I'll unpack that just by giving you the metaphor and then I think it'll make a lot more sense. So basically Crenshaw says, if you are at a traffic intersection and you are trying to sort of reconstruct how an accident has happened, right? There's, there's a traffic intersection, and there's been an accident. And you're trying to figure out how did that accident happen. Um, the kind of the kind of intersection that you're at is going to make this more more difficult or more easy, right? So if, so I grew up in a rural Saskatchewan, very small town, like oh, no paved roads, um, no stoplights, right? When traffic accidents happen, they're really pretty easy to reconstruct, right? It's just like a bunch of four way stops, right? And so if a tra traffic intersection happens, you, you, like it's just it's pretty easy to figure out okay what went wrong. Someone didn't stop it. If someone didn't yield at the stop sign or whatever it is, right? It's a very very simple thing, right? Whereas nowadays, I live in Massachusetts, right? Where we have all these crazy rotaries, right? I know you know these rotaries, right? You feel like you're taking your life in your hand whenever you're in, in one of these rotaries, right? It's terrifying, right? So you've got all of it. You've got like multiple lanes of traffic going really, really high speeds, um, traffic coming and going in lots of different directions. There's just a lot of balls in the air, right? Traffic, like, I know you've, you've driven through these things and they're terrifying, right? Certainly terrifying compared to, you know, a bunch of like sleepy four-way stops, right? Um, so if a traffic accident happens at, 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 at a rotary, it can be really kind of hard to know exactly how it happened. Like what went wrong first? You've got this like multiple car pileup. Okay, like how did it start? I don't know. There's just so many different um, factors to consider, right? Crenshaw says this is a really powerful way for understanding um, how oppression works um, when you're oppressed, not merely because you're a woman in the case of sexist oppression, but also, but also because you're a black woman, right? I mean, so if, if, if you are a person who is a woman, black, um, uh, lesbian, disabled, Right. Um, these are all different axes of oppression. These are all different um, ways. Like these, you might think of them as sort of different, different bird cages that people can be a member of. Right. Um, but the feminist movement, for the most part, had been thinking about uh, sexism as just, well, this is just something women experience. Women, full stop. Right. 
intersectionalist feminists like Kimberly Crenshaw come along and they point out that actually no, people don't experience um, sexism just as women. They experience also, they, they can also experience oppression because they are a black woman. And, if, and, and importantly, Crenshaw says, we shouldn't think of these experiences of the intersection of racism and sexism as, as being sort of additive, right? Where we can sort of pick out the part of her experience that is oppressive because she's a woman and pick out the other things she experiences that are oppressive because she's black and pick out the other things that she experiences because she's a lesbian. It doesn't work like that, right? She experiences the, the, the world as this unified being, right? As you know, a black lesbian um, woman. And um, her experiences of oppression are going to be just those experiences, right? So you can't talk to a white woman and say, oh yeah, this is the, 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 her, her, her experience of sexism is the same as mine. Because it's probably not going to be. Because her experiences of, of oppression is going to be compounded by these other oppressions that, that she experiences, right? So, so Crenshaw says that, that rather than thinking of these sort of multiple oppressions as being additive, we should think of them as being multiplicative, right? It's a heck of a lot more complicated much more quickly, right? Um, and again, so the, then the thought is, if we're actually going to try to understand what these experiences of, of oppression are, we actually have to talk to the people who experience them. We can't just kind of extrapolate from our own views if we don't share those experiences, right? So I, as someone who's a cis white woman, cannot understand what it's like to be um, to, to really ex experience the, uh, the, the sexist oppression that um, a trans black woman experiences, for example, right? So again, so, so the lesson, so you know, intersectionality is one of these words, it's almost like a like critical race theory. It's one of these words that, you know, like it, it, gets, it gets people up, up in arms sometimes, but um, it's a relatively simple concept, but it's very, very powerful. And it's powerful in part because one of the things it does is it helps correct those historical failures of feminism that I was talking about earlier, right? The failures of feminism to really attend to the women who need the help the most, right? The, the, the people who need feminism's help aren't the, aren't the people like me, right? Who are white and, you know, middle-class. Um, an able-bodied, right? The people who need feminism the most are the people who are, you know, living at the margins of, of society, people who don't have as much money as me, people who don't, who don't have as so, much, much social capital as me. And those are precisely the women that, at least historically, feminism has not been very good at actually talking to, not very good at actually listening to, and yet claiming to be, to be speaking on behalf of, right? So that's that's the really, really important uh, correction that we, that, that, that we get from intersectionality, the, you know, the recognition that, if feminists are going to claim to speak for all women, then we actually have to, you know, include all women in our movement, and we actually have to center the voices and experiences of those women who need the help the most. Okay, that is it in a nutshell. I think I've got eight minutes left for questions, so um, I would love to hear thoughts or comments or questions. We do have a little extra time if you if you want to run a little over oh, good oh, good but if if people have questions and now's the time you can throw them in chat and i can i can ask them for you or you can unmute and ask your questions anyone out there sorry i know i threw a lot at you <laughs> can i give more images or metaphors all day long oh yeah <laughs> for intersectionality absolutely yeah um another really great metaphor that we get from crenshaw is um she calls it a basement metaphor. And again, this is a really nice way of understanding those historical failures of the feminist movement. So Crenshaw says that when we think about um, the way feminism and other like anti-racism, a lot of these liberation movements have functioned, she says, that she says they, they've tended to function with what she calls a but for rule, right? So the thought is that, we, that, that feminism historically focused on women who, but for the fact that they were women, wouldn't, wouldn't be oppressed at all. And that racism, like anti-racist movements, often uh, focused on people for, for whom, but for the fact that they were black, wouldn't be oppressed at all. Who is that? Well, it's you know, it's 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 rich black men or middle class black men. Right? And to be clear, like I'm not saying that middle class black men can't experience racism. Obviously, they can, right? Um, but uh, 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 poor black women are going to experience a heck of a lot more oppression, right? So. Crenshaw says that another great image or metaphor that we have is the idea of a basement, right? So we can think of these liberation movements like feminism or anti-racism as operating where like, like the more oppressed you are, right? The more axes of oppression you have, the farther you are, are you down you are in the basement, right? And that the people who are um, the, the ones who tend to be sort of like steering the, 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 the ship, whether it's like the anti-racist ship or the, the anti-feminist ship are actually, you can sort of think of them as actually literally standing on the people who are more oppressed, standing on the necks or the faces of the backs of the people who are more oppressed, right? And again, so the thought is if, if feminism is just trying to make the world a little bit better for, for, for middle-class white girls, 
then it's true that those middle-class white girls, right? If, like, you know, the, the world isn't as good for them as it is for the middle-class white boys. So you're, you are helping people, but you're you're helping people who are barely in the basement to begin with, right? So she says that, we, that, that there's almost been like this sort of hatch where the only people getting out of the basement are the people who are barely in the basement, right? And the thought is that if we really, really want to be able to really under um, really undertake this radical project of addressing these historical problems of racism and sexism and classism and homophobia, we can't do that. We can't operate with this but for move, uh, uh, movement. We are, so, so the thought is, and I, and I do think that feminism, a lot of anti-racist stuff really has moved more in this inter intersectional direction of realizing that we actually have, like these are problems we have to tackle all at once. Yeah, intersection bird cages, right? Or yeah, sometimes I'm thinking like you have like bird cages in like, like in like a bird cage in a bird cage in a bird cage in a basement. I don't know, like you can get rid of it. <laughs> I'm trying to. You have a question? No, maybe that's not a question. Hi, Linda. You're un you're unmuted. If you wanted to ask your question. No. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm still I'm still formulating it. Actually, this is wonderful and. Uh, there's so many layers here, layers upon layers, that I find I come up with a question and then I am realizing that there are layers and layers more to that question. So I come up with one question, it leads to two questions, leads to four, and on we go exponentially. And so, yes, <laughs> yes I, absolutely. I think you well, might you I might find this helpful. There's because yes. I really do try to capture a lot of the complexity. And the paperback and is coming out in March. Yes. Okay. Shameless plug for the library. We have that book in our collection. So if you didn't oh, excellent. Good. Library. take the book out from the library. Perfect. Okay, I'll make sure we have it here in Ladysmith on Vancouver Island. Oh, perfect. Okay. Laura, yeah. Um, so I, um, I guess when I keep thinking about these things lately, um, because I'm almost, I'm going to be 60 next year. And, um, you know, I'm a teacher. So, um, you know, I've talked to students about various things over the years and things like that. But um, lately, my nieces um, are now 24. And they've graduated from college, and they're going out into the workplace. So like, it's just striking to me that like, I feel like I don't really have wisdom <laughs> for them. Um, like I don't necessarily have solutions. Um, and so this is, I don't know if this is a question necessarily, but you know, like my, my niece um, in her first job um, did a great job and um, she had this other new worker and they put, um, they took pictures of each of them or together maybe it was, um, and put them on their um, Facebook page on social media and said, you know, congratulations to our two new employees or whatever. And so, um, you know, there's her and then there's the other employee who was a guy. And literally everybody on social media was telling the guy how smart he was and what a great job he did. And everybody was telling my niece how pretty she was at 24. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, so we had this talk about it and, you know, she was like, what could I do? What could I do? And I was like, well, you know, long story short, you know, she did talk to her boss and everything, but, um, you know, we had to talk about, um, what is it? Prioritizing things, yeah. you know, like, you know, like this was not her boss's fault. I mean, granted he didn't have a clue, but now he does. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if my question is sort of, is there anything to say? <laughs> I think honestly, uh, when young women are coming of age, you think mm -hmm. even just noticing there's a problem, right? Because I think a lot of 24 year olds might not even have, even have noticed. Yeah, I mean, I didn't when I was that age. Yeah, you know, um, so. so I think it's I, th I think that we are making progress that we have, the, we have the language to be able to at least identify what's going on. I think that counts as like, but I think, yeah, I mean, like the mess we got to uh, that, that we got into, like it, it took us a long time to get here. So it's, you know, like it's going to take us a long time to get out, right? Um, but yeah, but I do think yeah, like recognizing there's a problem. I mean, it's 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 astonishing and wonderful to me to hear that like your niece would actually go to her boss and say like, hey, this is not okay, right? Like, well, this was after we talked about it. Great. She oh, was like, great. what can I do? And I was like, well, yeah. you know. Yeah. So. 
That's great. And she was like, he was a great guy. He's a totally wonderful man. And he just, it never had occurred to him. Why would it? No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So anyway, great talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I have to say that I, uh, to, um, the, the book, I, I don't, I don't want to put in the book, but this is, um, I, I wrote this with, in some part, in, in some ways with what it sounds like uh, the demographic that your nieces are in, in mind. Right. Mm. So like, um, we, we, we were like, I went back and forth a lot with the publisher about exactly like the, the voice that we wanted. And it, we, were, we were shooting for a really broad tent. Right. So we would say, yeah, everyone from like, you know, 16 to 60. Right. Um, <laughs> hey, that's ages. <laughs> yeah but actually you know part of it is like wow i'm gonna be 60 i'm not sure i have wisdom maybe so I mean, i'm i'm 44 and i got nothing so <laughs> thank you no i do i do have the solution for man spreading on public transit oh I yeah okay. to tell you oh, that. that's gonna be okay. helpful all right i will tell you that too so, so yeah first of all yes i need you all to go out and do the sociological study and confirm my suspicion that it is primarily white dudes who can't keep their mask over their damn nose um because i think i'm right about this um, but I would love to be proven wrong. And I do, and again, I do think it's not that there's wrong with white men. I think it's just, it's just, a, it's an indication of the kind of entitlement that, that we're getting um, from society, right? Hi, baby. Um, yep. Uh-huh. Okay. So, but the, uh, the, the, the solution to man spreading um, on public transit, right? So this actually comes from my sister, right? My sister is um, an epidemiologist who lives in Toronto. And this is actually pre-COVID, okay, that she came up with the solution. But so she's on the, on, on, on the subway one day going to work. And there's this man spreading guy trying to take up her entire um, subway seat, and she's tired. She wants to, you know, she wants to be able to sit down, so she sits down, and he's and he's and he, so she's like she's having to like rub into his leg because he's taking up way, way too much of his seat, right? And again, so she does this thing where she tries to sort of like like be passive aggressive and like assert her space, but then he gets creepy. And he's like, oh, she's rubbing into me. I'm gonna rub into her, right? And she's like, oh, all right. So she's about to sort of just like, get up and move because like she doesn't want to deal with this, and she starts coughing because she has a cold because it's Toronto in the winter and everyone's got a cold, right? And this guy who suddenly like turns out he can fit into his seat after all, because he doesn't want to be touching her because she's coughing. She wasn't like coughing on him or anything. She was just coughing, right? And she realized she stumbled on the solution for this, right? Because, and again, and sociologists have actually backed this up that, that um, if a woman actually directly confronts a man who is doing this, who is taking up more than his fair share of space, things can like, escalate very quickly. Right? They, they can like, they, they can turn to anger right they can turn like they can turn to, turn to so, so even violence right so women are not wrong to not want to like public like, escalate the situation and call the guy out right like move over and start swearing at him or something right and again also many women are socialized to you know to be nice and to be polite and to like smooth over over the over this social situation right this women are socialized into doing right um <laughs> coughing right like anyone can fake a cough right again don't cough on the person that would be that would, that would be you know aggressive and bad but you can just start coughing right they're not going to want to touch you they'll leave you alone you, you, you have your whole public you have your whole subway seat right so yeah there are solutions <laughs> carol we have a we have a chat question um Hmm. relate feminism and economic systems. Yes, yes, absolutely. So basically, I, I didn't talk as much about classism as I talked about racism in this talk, but I definitely could, right? So um, so there are a lot of, there isn't one way to relate feminism and, and any kind of like um, economic um, analysis, right? So some, so some Marxist feminists, for example, argue that um, capitalism and sexism are intimately intertwined, right? That's they, they point out that um, women function as like a reserve labor force that can be called in and out of a of, of labor force um, for the good of the economy, not for their own good, right? So when we think, when we think, think for example, what happened in World War II, right? You can do it. Women were told that it was their, you know, patriotic duty to work outside of the home, right? And you know, the world was over, and and those same women, women were told it was their patriotic duty to give those jobs, the jobs back to the men whose jobs they really were somehow, right? So these these are the kinds of things that that, that the Marxist feminists point out, um, but and. Um, that, that, that's one example of, 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 of the way that we can really <laughs> analysis and um, and an economic analysis. Um, in general, we can we, we can we can point out all of the ways that um, the harms of sexism are off, are often most experienced by women who um, who don't have the sort of economic means to um, have the kind of safety net that they, that they might need. Right. So, for example, um, what's happening in the U.S. right now with um, access to abortion, right? So, rich women have always had access to abortion, right? They've always been able to get it. Right, um, it's poor women who don't have access to safe, uh, safe legal abortion, right? And that, that, and that was the that was the huge victory of, of, of Roe was that it actually gave everybody abortion access. And what now abortion advocates are pointing out is that um, as as Roe is now weakened and chipped away, 
it's poor women who bear that brunt, right? Poor women who can't afford to take time off work to like, you know, and but to have to drive hundred of mi hundreds of miles to cross state lines um, and then have a waiting period before they can get an abortion, right? That's just not something that, that a woman with a, you know, with a minimum wage job can afford to do, right? So if, if you remove the access to safely legal abortion for her, it's um, like, she's the one who's bearing that brunt, right? Um, and again, like so, social issues of childcare, these sorts of things, right? It's, um, you know, money doesn't buy you everything, but it does buy you security, right? <laughs> it does buy you a safety net, right? And so, um, it, it, and that, that means that if, if a woman has, has economic means, she's gonna be able to sort of insulate herself from at least many of the harms of oppression, not all of them, but many of them. All right, any other questions? Guess not. Um, all right, thank you, Carol. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. I hope you enjoyed the talk and we'll have the recording out soon. Uh, Thanks folks. Hi, mom. My mom's here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for coming everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.